Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisig. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government industry leaders in the management and challenges evolving with the Internet of Things. With me today on the show are Rick Walsh, the mobility lead at the U.S. Army, Maria Rote, the chief technology officer of the Department of Transportation, David Woolman, the deputy director, Smart Grid and Cyber Physical Systems Program Office at NIST, David O'Barry, the worldwide technology strategist at Intel Security, and Alan Balutis, the senior director and distinguished fellow at Cisco Systems. Let's get right into the issues and uh, let's talk about this. Um, you know, traditional IT systems <clears throat> become more and more complex, and now we've got the reality of the Internet of Things. People talking about uh, how pretty much anything that's addressable by, I guess, IP or Bluetooth or any type of connectivity uh, will wind up being part of the, the network. Um, Rick, how about at the U.S. Army? Can you give us some examples of how you are making progress and preparing for the Internet of Things initiatives? Sure. Um, you, you may want to start, for the Army, we're looking at not just the Internet of Things, but we, we carried that a second step and talk about the identity of things. Hmm. We have to know what they are, where they are, and how they're communicating, because right now, um, you know, we're looking at um, wearables, the, the defense, sure. defense medical is looking at putting wearable devices, giving all the soldiers, I, you know, um, Fitbits and such. Mm -hmm. So we can start tracking that stuff, looking for Army health and wealth. But the idea is that everything has to be connected. So, you know, it creates a large security risk for us. I'm sure. I'm so sure. The, so the identity of things is equally as important as the Internet of Things. That's interesting perspective. And uh, maybe when we talk challenges, we can talk a little bit about that uh, security issue. Um, we'll probably do a whole show on that. Um, <coughs> Maria wrote over at Department of Transportation. I've been reading some pretty cool things about how you're doing things with the states and cities and challenges. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the progress that uh, you're making at Department of Transportation on uh, with the Internet of Things? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Sure. Um, the uh, transportation is really a system of systems. So when you look at it, and there's a lot of opportunity around the Internet of Things when you look at smart cities, mm -hmm. um, connecting it, and the impact on the road. There's a lot of opportunities when you go back and you look at 3.9 billion gallons of fuel wasted on the road by the truck drivers, you know, 4.8 billion hours spent on the road. It's just the, the waste that's happening. And when you start incorporating smart technologies into all of this, then you start saving time. And all that translates to dollars sure. um, just across the board. And, and across transportation, you know, all the research and development really feeds into that research and, um, and regulations and how we're going to um, move transportation forward as a country over the next several decades. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. That's um, I, I can't wait till when um, the guy who delivers my refrigerator and gives me a three-hour window actually shows up in that three-hour window. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Internet of Things will deal with that. It'll be a smart refrigerator. <laughs> it'll, it'll drive its way there. Um, Alan Valutis. Uh, Alan, um, I know Cisco's been uh, talking about connectivity and connecting everything together and and pulling things together. I mean, we've been talking for years about all these management devices and why do we need, you know, different proprietary products and whatever. So I think Cisco, when I think of the Internet of Things, uh, Cisco comes to mind as a company that uh, certainly would be out in the forefront. Can you tell us about some of the progress yeah, that you see I, I being think, made? Uh, I think Cisco has been in the forefront, and we, uh, we talk about the Internet of Everything mm -hmm. because we can get... Uh, beyond the machines themselves uh, and machine-to-machine -machine interactions and to talk uh, about other aspects of this issue in terms of people, uh, processes that bring in the privacy security issue, and of course data itself. And as these devices get smarter, these devices become self-assessing, self-learning, and, and, and producing information. <coughs> so I think picking up on um, the points that my two colleagues have made. It's a tremendous opportunity. The savings potential is enormous. Mm -hmm. The scale is uh, increasing exponentially. We, the McKinsey predicts there'll be 50 billion devices online by, tw billion, wow. by 2020, more than seven for every person in the world. Uh, the savings measure in the trillions has a dramatic impact on the network itself. 
We've already touched on the privacy security sure. issue, and it gets us into the role of government, both in standards, in regulation, and interoperability. So there's a lot to be talked about this afternoon on this important yeah. issue. Yeah, there really is. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's almost like you can let your imagination just go just about anywhere and think of, uh, come up with ideas uh, when you're talking about this subject. <coughs> uh, David Woolman at NIST, I guess when I think of NIST, um, I think of uh, a lot of scientists and, um, you know, working on standards, technologies, whatever. I would imagine you're looking out this issue from, uh, you know, a standpoint of what it, what it will mean for the future and so forth. Tell us a little bit about some of the progress going on at NIST with the uh, Internet of Things. Sure, definitely. This is an area in which is very exciting. NIST cares about measurements as well as helping work with industry and academia to set the foundations for things. We do a lot of work with frameworks understanding, and then also being able to translate this into standards and support the technical foundation mm -hmm. for these new technologies. We like to refer to this as cyber-physical systems. Uh, Internet of Things is part of that broader concept of mm -hmm. cyber-physical systems. And some of the work that we're doing, we're working with a public working group who have developed a draft framework for cyber-physical systems. We've also had a Global Cities Teams <laughs> Challenge effort in the smart cities space. And we're also working on test beds that will help to pull in this Internet of Things environment and make our measurements better. Hmm. Interesting. I like that. Cyber physical things. <coughs> I guess Internet of Things is easier to say, but nevertheless. Um, uh, David O'Berry, Intel Security. Tell us how uh, Intel is positioning in uh, to get ready for this and sure. how you support your customer base with sure, I, uh, Internet of Things kinds of issues. I think, I think when you think about the ubiquity of what we're talking about to echo some of what's going on here, it's like with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that oftentimes when you when you think about the Internet of Things and the numbers that he was, uh, that we were just, my, my colleague from Cisco was just talking about, 40% um, of the data by 2020 or 2021 will be from uh, from the Internet of Things devices. Mm. Uh, so when you think about that right now, only about 2 to 3% now. So do data growth rates of from now till then and say something that's 2 to 3% is going to be 40%. That is an astronomical number. So the... Um, ability to, to create this efficiency is amazing to me. So I call it the techno-industrial revolution 3.x wow. so, or 3.0 because you know you think about man and machine and how we kind of progressed. It's always been about ubiquity <laughs> and, and this still is a ubiquity situation but it's got to be about secure ubiquity. Mm -hmm. So I think now that, that we're, we, my friends at NIST have started these frameworks and, and going on with that in the internet of things that they're gonna we're going to have to interweave that uh, so that we don't really get the cart out in front of the horse and create an, a much more tragic situation right. than, than what we right. what we could do. Yeah, so. interesting. You know, I saw someone was telling me the other day that one of the f uh, motor companies, their um, their strategic plan for their cars of the future have more the cost of the technology going into the car far exceeds the actual cost of the car yeah. uh, in terms of what they're going to be going to be doing. Think about, um, oh, real quick, think about that, uh, the situation that just occurred. 2.8 million cars had to have their software updated. Right. At, when, that was the fastest recall I've ever seen. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a non-trivial situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Maria Rowe, let's um, talk a little bit about, uh, can you talk about a program? A lot of our listeners always say, you know, give me an example of a pro It's easier to understand sometimes what you're talking about if you talk about an actual program that's uh, working. Can, is something come to mind that you'd like to cite here maybe and uh, talk we, about? Well, we have an initiative going on right now around Smart City where we're holding mm -hmm. a competition. And we received recently 78 applications from cities, mid-sized cities across the U.S. And there's $50 mm -hmm. that DOT um, and partners will be um, contributing towards a smart city, oh. so there'll be a down select of five, and the secretary there will. Be a million in there someplace, not fifty million, fifty dollars. Fifty million. million, yeah, yeah. fifty million. Uh, what did I say? Million. Fifty million. Like, fifty. I what government <laughs> program is a name? Millions and, or billions? Yeah. That's awesome. But it's good catch. Right. Fifty million. $50 million, you know, being put up with uh, with transportation. Of course, the cities will um, have to contribute as well. Right. But of those 78 cities, there'll be a down select. Uh, the Secretary, uh, Secretarial Fox will announce at South by Southwest on March 12th okay. who the five finalists are. And there'll be, an, as out of that down select come June, 
there will be um, the announcement in June in the, the city. And the midsize city was really selected because you can scale up or scale down with that. Interesting. And really looking at you know, what's going to come out of that smart city. You know, how is what's the proposal from that smart city? I haven't seen all of those, but yeah. I hear that it's really cool. Some of the, the proposals from I the bet cities. Some really great ideas. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, but there's. <laughs> Just think about that, a connected, a smart city across the board, and that could be connected intersections with the vehicles to lights to mm -hmm. just all the modes of transportation and how that's going to work. So it's up to the cities to propose, and coming out of that, there'll be the announcement in June for that. So we are Excellent. really looking forward to that. We weren't expecting 78 proposals. Um, we were expecting less than that, and it was just a ton of excitement. It was a ton of excitement exciting. across the whole department sure. because we were watching. It was almost like a yeah. ticker. Yeah, they you know, care about I was this. getting a little. <laughs> I was getting updates. You yeah, know, right. throughout the day. Okay, we got another one. We're up to forty-three. Okay, we're up to fifty-six, wow. and then we got to seventy-eight, and that was that was huge. A lot of excitement just across the department I'm sure, on I'm that. Sure, so. I'm sure that's very cool. I guess when you went, got into, it, you're saying, well, I wonder if people are really going to be interested in this or not, and. Obviously, yep. they've exceeded expectations. Uh, David Wolman, how about over at NIST? Do you have a specific program maybe that you would point at that you think going, you're, uh, you're working that's going to make a difference? Yes. The, um, the work that we've done with industry and academia and government in a public working group around cyber physical systems and Internet of Things has revealed ways to understand the systems engineering process and also to be able to address some of the concerns that folks have mm -hmm. that you want to make sure uh, create a functioning assured cyber physical system or internet of things. One specific thing within there to give you an idea of the intellectual richness of this, we've identified trustworthiness as a key aspect. Interesting. Very and trustworthiness interesting. is the combination of security, privacy, resiliency, safety, and uh, reliability. All of these have risk management approaches and strategies, and we've you know, been able to start now thinking of what happens when you start combining those. How do you make something trustworthy and be able to do the trade-offs between all of the different subcomponents that you really need to make something that you can rely on? That's interesting. You know, that, that be, it's like when we would do um, projects of uh, you know your supply chain and things like that how do you know who you're do doing business with somewhere in that supply chain you know is there a vulnerability or a weakness that uh, that is unknown and I think it stretches <coughs> us in ways because you know, we've approached things from say a cybersecurity and privacy point of view but this brings a broader perspective sure. it was like kind of that lens that revealed hey there's this larger concept that we need to wrestle with right. so I think that's going to be exciting for the future yeah it is exciting uh, Rick Walsh how about the Army is there a specific program you'd point to you you talked about wearables. Uh, obviously, that's one. Well, one thing that we're doing, and it's it's kind of changed in the sense we're trying to connect these, is that we talk about industrial control systems. We're looking at how do we manage all these systems that operate the country for us. Water control, heating, power, stoplights, cities. How do you manage those? Uh, in, the, in the past, they've always been disconnected. They've been on separately maintained mm -hmm. networks. And now we're bringing those networks together. And the comment, we're looking at data, uh, we have a huge issue of, you know, when you take a drink out of a fire hose, you nearly get wet. When we create, create this much data, we're going to get wet. So how do we take advantage and use the data so that it's effective? And that's kind of where the moving in industrial control systems, we're looking at a great influx of data, and it's now our task to figure out how to use that data to make it effective. Yeah, very interesting. I like that analogy, too. <coughs> um, David Hoberry, what... Um, if I asked you uh, to talk about a specific program sure. that comes to mind that uh, you know you think is going to make a, a have a big impact or make sure. a difference, FirstNet. Um, so basically, now FirstNet, I've, I've been working with them for for quite some time, and uh, in November picked up the chief architect role within Intel Security Group to actually try to. Uh, you know, bring it home as the as far as what the solution is oh, to wow. this. Oh wow, the first net program itself. Yes, sir. I so think band, the RFP's out now. Too, yes, sir. So it is. Uh, so band fourteen, um, basically, that is first responder focused. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about it is, is that um, it's not a business as usual network. Right. Uh, it's got a lot of interesting aspects to it. But going back to what. Uh, Dave said over here that uh, it's about availability first, you right. know, so when you look at confidentiality, integrity and availability, oftentimes we kind of get stuck on that confidentiality thing. But if you don't enable the tip of the spear, you know, you can't, you know, I can't have a, a first responder somewhere in EMT saying, you know, can you hear me now? Right. You know, that that's, that's not a model that <laughs> works in that environment. So, um, <laughs> 
I think the interesting mm-hmm. thing about that, to, to mention the wearables, mm-hmm. the sensor aspect of that, it's an amazing amount of information. And, and to use that big data capability to down-select and to make people's lives better, that is an Great amazing data. capability. I think FirstNet has the opportunity, not just here in, in this nation, but actually globally, to mm-hmm. be able to, because uh, it's, it's a global program as well that's being enacted right. by uh, South Korea, not North Korea, South Korea and some others sure. as well. I think there, there's a huge difference that it can make. Sure, it's going to be fun to watch. I mean, that issue's been around a long, long time. And I'll look back to the years uh, my... Uh, ran Secret Service uh, communications with the interoperability question and communicating with first responders. And um, back then we did interoperability. I would put mobile radios in the back seat of the car and I la- I'd label, I'd there? label one FBI, <laughs> one local police, one and say, if you want to talk to the FBI, pick up that radio. If you want the local police, this radio. And you can tell <laughs> by how many antennas were That's yeah. right. Are. But in that, in that <laughs> situation... You can still, we still have that issue. Have that. Take a look. Um, Alan, how about um, out at Cisco? Is there a pr- program that you would like to highlight maybe that you think is one that... Yeah, uh, there, there is a special group in Cisco that has... Um, focused on the Internet of Everything. I think we have done um, lots of the basic research in terms of the growth growth in the number of devices, uh, their impact on uh, sectors of the economy in terms of the savings potential uh, and the impact on customers. And, of course, we've, um, we've done some work on the technological impact, uh, the need for architectures, the need for interoperability, and, and of course, the need to um, uh, improve our aging infrastructure. I mean, in terms of the Department of Defense, I mean, they, they transmit, uh, you know, 100 plus <coughs> gigabits uh, at, at, at present, and that's not going to be enough. Right. with these devices that are coming online, not only the sheer number of devices, but you know the building in the privacy security aspect. That's why I very much like the NIST use of uh, trustworthiness, because that'll be a key aspect in terms of um, public acceptance of these devices going forward, where e- each home is going to have like 50 to 100 smart devices, wow. and that's going to be standard. Wow. It's going to be some exciting stuff, boy. Um, you have a comment on that, David? I would say that the interesting thing about that is that when you think about um, interoperability, right, standards. Mm-hmm. So what NIST is doing here, and, and he's pointed out, um, uh, it's very important to make sure these are open standards that everything is working together with. We can't be in our stovepipes. And that's what I think the government has done a great job of pushing that forward, specifically through NIST, specifically through DOD, mm-hmm. DOT, DHS, to say, Here's how we're going to, you know, we expect our vendors to work together to make this ecosystem stronger. Yeah, it's going to take the community working together, no doubt yes, about sir. it, if this and is going to work at all. There's a pivotal role for government in this. Maybe we can get on to that in, sure. the, in the yep. next segment. Right. Uh, Maria, you have a co- comment, yeah, too? I mean, you're talking about the architecture. There's a lot of work we've done in southeast Michigan in our test bed, and we've actually <coughs> developed um, an architecture that people can go out and use. So developers, the open community, they can go out there and use that as well as some of the APIs. So out of that test bed, when you talk about results and and what is happening in some of the projects, that's another way that, you know, with transportation that we've laid out the architecture. How do you do that? Because, you know, think about everybody drives on the right side of the road. All your stop right. signs are red octagons. How do we get to that in this connected space? And we've done Very a lot of work in the architecture space, as well as making available um, those APIs. Yeah, Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, we're going to talk about some lessons learned, too. But first, we're going to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisig here with Rick Walsh from the U.S. Army, Maria Rote from Department of Transportation, David Woolman from NIST, David O'Barry from Intel Security, and Alan Baloudis from Cisco Systems. We're talking the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything or cyber physical things. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of terms that we've uh, already uh, uh, nailed here in this first segment. But let's talk about some of the lessons learned. Um, As you think about these things, as I mentioned myself, when I even try to imagine just some of the things that can be done to the future, um, you know, it's 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 your mind can go, you know, 
all over the place in terms of ideas and, and, and where this can all go. But um, you guys are, are all working on this stuff. What are some of the lessons learned in some, on some of these initiatives maybe that you would pass on or we can pass on to other colleagues, other agencies that are also working uh, the, these issues? Let's start this time with uh, David Wolman. David, sure, what are I some would of say... the lessons you're learning as you uh, work your way through some of these issues? Uh, I would say collaborate and think big. Um, Collaborate, think big, okay. I mean, in some ways, this area gets us a little bit out of our comfort zone. We want to dive in and do the details of measurements, but this connected environment and world is going to be the place where all sorts of critical measurements, performance indicators, et cetera, are going to be necessary. What we've done in our Smart Cities effort, having a Global Cities Teams Challenge, is that we've gotten teams of cities and innovators together mm -hmm. and around action clusters, around specific topics. By getting that collaborative spirit where you have multiple cities giving their needs, that is a way to make sure that you're getting the uh, solutions that will be applicable in multiple cities, not just one custom right. I city. And so that collaboration <laughs> thing is important. And then thinking big, you know, we, we wanted to have an international presence. So we, we, we did the work to recruit international cities and that has brought a, a, a very interesting, broader perspective and given the U.S. companies the opportunity to engage on that international front, which helps us with the standards. It helps us with all sorts of applications. So I think yeah. collaborate and think big. Yeah, I like that. Collaborate and think big. Um, <clears throat> Rick Walsh, what do you think? What are some of the lessons you're learning here as you're working your way through some of these uh, interesting issues that you're, you're dealing with? Well, for the Army, I think the, um, our biggest lessons learned is that it's not about the things itself. I mean, everybody wants to have the Fitbits, the smartwatches, the cool toys, but if we don't have a goal behind them, we end up deploying devices and putting devices in people's hands that are just there. Yeah. So we have to make sure, and we do it, and then the second part of that is um, be open-minded and do what you can because you don't know what you're going to get. You're, you're trying something new, and it's going to change. Greatest example I've got today is if you ask this, ask any group that you go to, who has a, um, a standalone GPS anymore? Very few people, mm -hmm. because you got a phone, you got a smartphone, and it now turns into your GPS. That was not why you have a smartphone, but that is what it came into. Right. So the second order effect of the Internet of Things is going to be great, but you need to start out with the tangible results that you can measure right out of the box, because if you don't, you're not going to get the money to continue your process. Yeah, very interesting. Very good point. Uh, Maria, um, what are some of the lessons you're learning along the way here as you, other than the fact that there's a lot more interest out there than you maybe in initially anticipated? I think uh, part of this is across the federal government and even working with states, we need to be smarter about who's doing what around the Internet of Things. Um, David mentioned earlier about FirstNet. When you take emergency responders, the FirstNet piece of it, tie that into transportation, tie that into emergency responders. And how about the person that's there during a disaster that has a sensor because they have a heart condition? And how does the how do the emergency responders get to that person? How do, you know, the medical person now get there? How do they know that that road is clear? And you can tie in all of these elements in these sensors, this Internet of Things, to be smart about how you get to that person and how you do that. Um, you know, that's on a much bigger scale. But look, at, when you look at the space across the federal government, there's a lot of interplay between what we're doing and not just the government, but with industry and with the state. So looking at it from a bigger picture, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, we were doing some work around some of the data that we get, safety data and those kind of things. And the question came up, and this is about being creative right. with information. Right. The question came up, um, what states are collecting um, mileage when when people go get their emissions checked? How do we tie that into transportation? Well, who gets that emissions data? What does EPA get? So we reached out to the EPA to find out what they were getting from the states to be able to tie that in to some things that we're looking at to tie into our data um, in transportation. So when you start looking at um, all these pieces and parts, <coughs> That broader look and knowing what's going on with other agencies across the federal government and the states, how the states are moving data, how that's being fed in, I think is is just incredibly important to be able to tie that in. And, you know, ultimately this goes to ladders of opportunity for the citizens that are out there, better opportunities sure. and services across the board. Absolutely, yeah. It's like, um, you know, you don't want the railroad tracks when they finally come together, they, they don't match or <laughs> reminds me. 
back when we did the reinventing government thing, we took a look at what different agencies were collecting in terms of data and just the enormous amounts of data being collected you know, sometimes by satellite, sometimes that was not being used by that agency. In some cases, agencies were using like 2% of the data they were collecting, and the rest of the data was just going into, you know, bit bucket somewhere that nobody paid attention to. But if you looked at it, you realized that data is incredibly valuable to others. And um, so to now begin looking across all of these different ways, the way as just as you described, take a look at what others are doing and how can we begin sharing some of those There's that a data. Lot of I bet there is. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting subject. Um, um, David, you had a comment on that? Yeah, I wanted to add in uh, an example for smart grid in this area. At the edge, where you have all sorts of devices, you have the Internet of Things devices. You want to have the ability for them to act upon that data, to gather the data and act upon it. So we've been working on some publication subscribe kind of capabilities at the edge, which I think will be very informative for this Internet of Things intersection with energy. E excellent point. Another excellent point. Uh, Alan Blutis, um, as we talk, Cisco's been thinking about the, the Internet of everything for a long, long time. <coughs> what are some of the key lessons you think that uh, you're learning along the way that you would pass on to others that... Uh, perhaps would help them in terms of uh, some of their initiatives? Well, uh, I, I think several people have touched upon these issues. One is the immense amount of data that's produced from these devices. But these devices themselves are becoming smarter. They're becoming self-analyzing uh, and self-learning. Mm -hmm. So they're getting to the point where that data is not just data, it's information. And the devices are getting increasingly sophisticated uh, enough so they can transmit that data in the form of the right information to the right person at the right time. It was interesting to me, I was out at the Consumer Electronics Show mm -hmm. in, in January, and, and actually the area that was getting the most attention were these Internet of Everything, Internet of Things devices and their impact on the, um, the economy. And I think one of the key issues emerging was the integral role the government needs to play in, in this and the challenges to government because it, it will force them to be much more agile. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to respond very, very quickly to keep up with the tremendous growth in the technology that we're seeing. And the number of agencies that are affected and impacted and need to be involved, because we had a panel that involved NIST, um, transportation, but also the FTC and implications for the FCC and other parts of commerce. And so, uh, I, I mean, this is going to present a great opportunity, but also a great challenge to mm -hmm. the government to be able to both keep up and ensure that... Uh, trustworthiness oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. and privacy security that 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 will <coughs> ensure acceptance yeah yeah excellent point too um, uh, and, and and I like that maybe when we talk challenges we'll talk a little bit more about that security and privacy challenge because I'm sure that's going to be I mean face it, it's enormous now with uh, what what's out there today and it's not going to get any simpler as these devices become more and more complex and into into the future uh, David O'Berry what do you think in terms of some of the lessons you're learning sure. along the way here what are some of the things that um, you know others might want to hear about sure. I think that, you know, as we've talked about, you know, you want to go, you really want to go big. You want to think outside of the box in this situation. But at the same time, um, we've, we've touched on it. Don't reinvent the wheel. You know, everybody doesn't have to be their own special snowflake in this situation. Because what I'm, what I'm saying, to get the bandwidth to innovate, you have to do certain things at, at, at as standard as possible so that you don't eat up a lot of resources, you know, for this person having this version of a framework and all this other stuff. So if you, if you do this reuse aspect, then the community can get involved as as, as you were mentioning earlier, the community can get involved and they will embrace it. I always say that, you know, humanity will participate in its own survival if given the chance. And that is the open source and the open, the open uh, standards market. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan, you have a comment on that? Yeah, I do. And, and one of the things that I see that's very promising on the private sector side is that a number of big companies, <coughs> Cisco, AT&T, General Motors, IBM, have begun to come together um, to work on this issue. And on the government side, 
Um, we've seen uh, efforts to at least raise the need for whether we should have a national uh, IoT strategy uh, oh, that will ensure, and some of the ideas are coming from the congressional branch, which is uh, most unusual mm -hmm. in, the, in the technology arena. Yeah. So there, there are good signs uh, uh, of, of progress or recognition of the need for uh, yeah, I, I actually yeah. think the government can lead the way here, just like we were talking about Absolutely. that, simply because the smart government aspect, in order for a smart society, you mm -hmm. have to, you know, the, the government leads that way with the with smart government. Right. Right. And, I, and you've already seen some of the things that are going on. And, and I think that when you start talking about how you get out in front of it, I think that uh, I was 20 years state government. So the best information always comes from the edge. Yeah. You know, is whether or not we could consume that at some point in time, that was that was the challenge. Now we can. Yeah. You know, so now let's let's get that information from the edge and do with it. You know, uh, the great things. Yeah. Well, what we saw is to say for government anyway is steer not row. I mean, uh, you know, try to keep yeah. everything moving under some type of a strategy. But, you know, do the collaboration thing big and let others do the actual, you know, innovation and, and creativity and, and get everyone involved. We don't want to be reactive like we were with the drone registration program, you know, right. because you kind of that's one of those things that kind of gets out of the out of out of control pretty quick. So, you know, it's good to, it's, you can't see everything coming, but you also don't want to all of a sudden say, everybody's got to register a drone so we don't, you know, create a problem somewhere. I get why, but you just, I would like to have that out front of where we are, you know, yeah. instead of, and it's hard sometimes, but I think, uh, I think the, the, the government has done a great job of, of starting to say, look, industry, you need to think about this in a standards way. You need to cooperate with one another because we're, we're not going to, you know, we don't want to get rolled on the backside of this. Yeah, very interesting point. And I know when when Alan was talking about the Consumer Electronics Show and the gadgets and devices made me think of the, the next generation workforce, too. Uh, <coughs> when that next generation workforce comes along, um, you know, what the kids do with the devices these days is just unbelievable. So, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, creativity and innovation and ideas and where this stuff's going to go in the future, um, again, you just let your imagination go. Uh, Maria? And on the creativity side of it, you know, I know from the transportation's perspective, we've had, you know, challenges and prizes and things like that to really draw in, you know, that development community to say, well, can, we, we've got this data what can we do with it and really build on that? Yeah. So FirstNet, same thing. Creating these these you know these app creation contests where they're actually funded to where they'll actually come in and you know uh, create apps for first responders. I've judged a few of these you know the, these you know uh, situations as well. But now they actually have a, a a sum of money to go out and say how do you innovate and let's get the people in that can innovate this situation and mm -hmm. and uh, and create apps that actually make the world safer. Yeah, well, learning that Spectrum's worth some money when it's uh, auctioned <laughs> off has really helped a lot when it comes to FirstNet. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, the, the tough things, <clears throat> the difficult things, the challenges out there. Um, <clears throat> let's, start, um, let's start with uh, Maria this time. Maria, <clears throat> what do you see as some of the really, really tough challenges that you still need to overcome or that we're going to need to overcome to really get to where we want to go with a lot of this stuff in the future? Uh, a couple of things around that. When you look at, you know, the 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 standards, we've talked about that quite a bit. Where, mm -hmm. What is the role of transportation setting those standards? So NHTSA has some things out there for comment around the connected vehicle. I see some head nods around the table. Um, how do we get in front of that? Uh, how do we use that? What mm -hmm. data should we be getting? You know, that's another challenge. You know, we do get some data for states. When you, in particular, like the safety you know, accidents, pedestrians, right. whether it's cars, motor carriers, airplanes, whatever. We get all of that safety data. Um, I think the dynamic is changing how we're going to receive that data. Do we get it once a year? Do we get it once a month? Do we get it near real time? And I think the pace is going to increase. So when there is an accident, for instance, or a pedestrian gets hit or something happens, the reporting up through the state, I think, will accelerate and that we'll have that information, that data to turn it into in, information more readily available. We're doing some prototyping now around how we're taking that, that safety data um, that we have today overlaying census data, demographics on it, and looking at across all the modes of transportation so that you can actually see trends over over time, over days of the week, right. over hours of the day. So we're putting together a prototype, a dashboard essentially, and we're and we're visualizing this data now around that. And I think just the pace is going to increase. So instead of getting 
some data from you know some states once a year, depending on the right. type of what right. it is in the regulation. So I think there's some regulations that need to catch up on it. Mm -hmm. But from internally, you know, how we're using that data to turn it into information to better inform and feed that back to whether it's the public or into regulations. That's going to be take one action. of the things that mm -hmm. we can take action on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Alan, you have a comment with Maurice. Yeah, I I think I'd come back to the issue uh, I I raised a little bit earlier about the important role for government here. As, as standards develop, uh, we, we can't allow separate standards in separate sectors. Right. You know, so we talked about the broad implication across the economy and across the nation in, in this. So there are exciting things happening in transportation, in health care and the like. It, you, you can't, it, it will be devastating for the growth in, in this area if the transportation sector develops standards yeah. different than the healthcare Absolutely. sector, different Absolutely. than that. Absolutely. So the key role for NIST, um, <clears throat> key role for um, the, the, the Congressional Caucus on the information, uh, the, the um, Internet of Things, key role for government to, to be, uh, achieve the interoperability and agility that's needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all, all excellent right. points. Excellent points. Um, Rick, what do you think are some of the, the big challenges that you still need to overcome in order to get where you want to go with, uh, you know, these initiatives? <clears throat> well, looking at what we're talking about today, the Internet of Things, right now in traditional architecture, I know where my boundary is. As I increase the Internet of Things and put more devices in, Actually, I'm seeing beyond my IT infrastructure. I'm seeing into the people. So now my responsibility extends not just to the hardware, not just to the mobile device, but actually to the person. So now not only do I know the health of my network, I know the health of my people. So that's a, that's a big difference. And having said that, we run into the situation today where we talk about, which is really big in the news, privacy. Mm -hmm. So now that if, if I ask you to wear a sensor... I have to protect that information. So we're talking about privacy of the people. Right. So that's a big area. Absolutely. And, and that's something that we have not introduced before in terms of making, making this available. When I put a, a medical sensor on every soldier, okay, I've got to protect that information. I've got to protect that privacy. But then again, I've got to be able to use that information effectively or why did I do it? So I get, we're looking at, you know, the political nature of it, society of it, you know, the socioeconomic issues that we're doing when we, when we, when we increase this boundary, when we increase mm -hmm. every person, every, everybody's a sensor now. Right. Your hardware is telling me what's going on. Your personal, your wearable devices are telling <laughs> me how you are doing. So now I can tell. One of the big, great examples is the um, Border Patrol down in, in the Texas-Mexico area. Mm -hmm. they, wear, they wear body armor and sensors right. in their body armor that measures their heart rate. So they know if something happens and that, that agent, that, that sheriff's heart rate spikes, they give the guy a call. Hey, what happened? Right. So, but again, how do I protect that? That's right. new stuff. Absolutely. Privacy yeah, that, is And great. that privacy question begs, you know, it, it forces you to ask that tough question, does the good outweigh the bad? You know, you have to look at what, what good will come out of this innovation or initiative and what bad potentially can happen, and then someone needs to make those judgment calls of the good outweighing the bad. Uh, and back to the point that Maria made that, uh, that um, it comes to mind about just how fast we're getting data. We've had, and I've talked at this radio show a number of times, that we are actually approaching a time in, uh, <clears throat> in our history where decision making, we're gonna be living in, in, in a world where time is approaching zero when it comes to how fast decisions can be made and data can be moved and, and things have to be done because everyone, uh, you know, with FirstNet, things like that, when the interconnectivity is there, you're gonna get data instantaneously and decision making is going to be done instantaneously. It's gonna create a very fascinating world. I wanna hear more about the challenges uh, from a f and, and, and move towards the future, but we need to take a short break you're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with Rick Walsh from the U.S. Army, Maria Rote from the Department of Transportation, David Woolman from NIST, David O'Berry from Intel Security, and Alan Balutis from Cisco Systems. We're talking about challenges with the Internet of Things when we went to break. Uh, uh, David Woolman from NIST, we haven't heard uh, from you. What are some of the big challenges that you're
you're bumping into day to day that you know, need to be overcome to, to get to where you want to go with these programs? Sure. I like some of our <clears> conversation <throat> in which we've been talking about different domains and them working together. At NIST, we have a big focus on measurement science, and we have a lot of test beds, a lot of mm -hmm. deep measurement capability. But what we're starting to do, we've started with the smart grid area in which we're pulling together the communication aspects, pulling together different components that need to work with each other. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to generalize that into this Internet of Things world. So some of our concepts are to create, you know, a system of systems needs a test bed of test beds. So we need to have test beds that can work together in a federated, remote kind of capability. We want the ability to understand a domain. So like with a combination of hardware in the loop, with some co-simulation mm -hmm. you know, platform engine, with some devices that you really want to probe, we should be able to kind of represent the domain and then have that right next to another domain and look at the interactions. So I think it takes our test bed approach to a new level. So I think that's a really challenge for yeah, us. That is, that is. Uh, David O'Berry, what do you think are some of the big challenges that you see that need to be uh, addressed and perhaps overcome before sure. we really get to where we want to go with all of this. Um, I, I think uh, I think we're going to get there, whether we're <laughs> whether we're really ready to get there or not. I think it really goes back oftentimes to education of people. I think that we have to create good digital citizens, mm -hmm. and the and and the way we do that is to is to make sure that they understand you know what they're actually you know opting into when they do certain things. And I I, I, I kind of like that opt in by the way too because yeah. I think some people are going to be afraid of this stuff. Yeah, and I I think if we could. Very we could really throw cold water on the situation if we have too many more issues where you drive a car off the the road as a test, you know, from sitting on your couch, like we had with you know with that last cars, recall. I just see. To my my thing is that how do you know? So I think that we have to really go into this with the idea that we we don't want to chill the entire situation by letting something get out out in front of us. Yeah. Um, I think the only way we can do this is that you know everybody has their own micro cloud now. You know, and, and I think from my perspective is that when you have multiple devices, you said seven devices per, just do the math. This Each home is now going to be a small or medium government or business concept. Right. And this is hundreds of situations there. So, and I've always said I wouldn't put my refrigerator on the internet. And I saw CES this year, I'm definitely putting my refrigerator on the <laughs> internet. But, you know, in that situation, when it starts to order for me, which is so cool because it can measure all these things, you know, I don't want a thousand gallons of milk to show up on my doorstep. Yeah, right. Right? Because, you know, you literally get physically milk dust. But then I mean, you know. It will tell you it's there <laughs> and it, it will tell you when it's going down. That's right. So, <laughs> so I know my son can drink a lot of milk, but it's not, you yeah. know, so, but, but I think that the, the challenge with it is to make sure that we don't replicate over and over. And this, what he said about the federated test beds, I think that if you think about how genetic research is done and stuff like that, mm -hmm. we're starting to really, if we could do that in cybersecurity and, and how we do this for the Internet of Things, right. that would be fantastic because we don't have to get independent results and then do that, that multi-diff situation would be very powerful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I guess that's why nice having NIST out there to do those test beds and uh, you try to stuff out before, uh, before we actually do create product, go to market. Uh, Alan Blues, you made a comment, but I, I haven't asked you the question direct about what are some of the big challenges that you see at Cisco that need to be overcome, that you need to work through to, you know, make some of this stuff become reality. Well, I, I touched on some of them and some of the other speakers have uh, as, as well, and, and that is the exponential growth, you know, 5.5 million devices being added each day beginning the beginning of this year, and that's going to continue uh, through 2020. Um, Department of Defense network that's capable of uh, transmitting 10 gigabits per second, which is going to be too slow <laughs> it, 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 with, with 50 billion devices uh, on, online. So uh, I think it, people becoming nodes on the Internet themselves. You know, you're going to be able to swallow a pill that will contain a device that will transmit information to your doctor on the state of your digestive system wow. and, and such. So it, it's, it, it's, almost, it, it's so futuristic in terms of its implications that it, it really is uh, striking. And it, it, it is an area, we've touched on this before, but, uh, you know, government is so criticized these days in the current political uh, environment, but government is in the forefront. We've seen, we've heard about many examples here today. You, you could cite 
uh, ones from other departments uh, beyond transportation and DOD, interior, state, agriculture right. are doing things. A and uh, the smart and connected cities uh, examples for smart parking, smart lighting, smart security, smart trash pickup, you know. Yeah, are, yeah, really. Wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful yeah, stuff absolutely. that can trans absolutely. transform. Let's face it, it's politically, you know, popular to run against the bi big bureaucracy, but when you actually start peeling that onion back, there are some really really, really fantastic things that go on across government and in government agencies. And when people start thinking of things that would go away without government, people's minds change pretty quick. Uh, we're down to uh, just under 12 minutes to go, and we like to, I always like to end the show by uh, talking a little bit about what this, all this means for the future. <clears throat> So let's hear from uh, each of the panels. We'll start with David and work our way down sure. the, the table here. David, what's uh, your like one and a half minute version of the crystal ball in your head and where sure. this is all going down the road? Um, we, we've talked about ingrained technology. I think that, you know, talking about swallowing a pill and getting your, you know, bio and stuff like that. These things are going to be, this digital thread has to, is, has to not be bolted on. It has to be ingrained within people. Not just the technology, but actually how you actually consume the technology and what the outcomes of that type of situation are. So I think as you go forward, what you'll see is we can increase lifespans and things like that, but we don't want to create a situation where we uh, consume a technology that we don't understand, you know, uh, before we, we have the standards around it to secure it and to do those right. types of things. So ubiquity is, uh, is an amazing situation. But like I said, I've said on, on the show before, um, many hands make light work. Uh, I think many eyes, many minds make great work. And I think that's where the communities have to work together. And I think the government's doing a great job of leading that type of charge to where we do get to work together to create a safer digital environment going forward so that, you know, my kid may end up with something that's, in, you know, embedded in his ear. And, you know, but I want to make sure that that is a safe device, yeah. that that is a, that is a device that adds to the ecosystem. Is not I think we learned that with cybersecurity. You know, we've been patching and create, um, we built things and put them out there and we've been fixing all the security uh, problems with them ever since. Yeah. So I think the lesson learned is think about these things up front before we actually uh, deploy them. Uh, David, what do you think in terms of uh, it looks like? What's this all look like to you down the road? Where's sure. this all going? I mean, in some sense, I'm hoping that the government can be <clears throat> an enlightened cheerleader and first adopter to help promote convergence. But I want to focus in on just one particular idea okay. for the future. It's like when you buy something, you get an instruction manual often. Mm -hmm. But we're living in this world that's both the cyber and the physical. When you buy something, say a car, an airplane for the government or whatever, shouldn't you also get a working model for understanding what its capabilities are, how to reconfigure it? Kind of like an instruction manual that goes electronic and pulls in all of the connectedness of the Internet of Things world. That way, when we buy stuff, we'll be able to plug it into models and understanding of how it works with other infrastructures. So that's just one vision for the future. Yeah, excellent. I like that. Very good. Um, and nobody likes those instruction manuals anymore anyway. And I mean, you know, <laughs> that's right. You know, you're supposed to just plug it in and it works. You know? Tell your smart um, home to read the instruction manual for your smart Internet of Things devices. That's right. That's right. Or else uh, what I do is just ask my kids, how do you do this? Um, um, Alan Belutis, what do you think? Alan, what's it look like down the road to you? I, Where's I'd, this all going? I'd, I would come back to two points. Um, okay. We've mentioned uh, a lot of the things that are going on in government agencies, um, the NIST draft framework, but a National Security Agency has a lab dedicated to uh, IoT issues. DARPA is beginning to fund, they have a $36 million grant program um, to, to look at the security privacy issues. I really do think, I, I'm a, strongly in favor of moving toward a national IoT, IOE strategy. Mm -hmm. So we have this integration and we have government um, clearly uh, designated to play a strong leadership role. Uh, but secondly, this issue of trustworthiness, uh, I'd come back, one of the classic works on privacy in, in this nation uh, talks about it as being a continuum. On one end are the, um, uh, the kind of uh, privacy evangelist, and those are the people who drive a lot of the debate. Uh, on the other end, they make up 10 or 15 percent of the population. The other side is the there's no name for them, but they're the people you see on TV re reality shows that are willing to give away every last bit of information about themselves right. for a, the chance of. Absolutely. But 
the 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 middle seventy eighty percent are what they designate as privacy entrepreneurs, which are the and so the public is willing to give up information about itself if it if it's no if it knows there are security protocols sure. in place and they see some benefit uh, Absolutely. so we've talked about the tremendous benefits that can be achieved that needs to be part of the discussion to ensure trustworthiness which will drive acceptance Absolutely. and will drive out fear of this big brother great points. implications great points yeah yeah i joined global entry so i don't have to stand in those lines right. at tsa exactly. you know i mean i'm willing to give up that information yeah. to perfect, go to the front of the line perfect example. Uh, <clears throat> maria wrote what do you think where's this all going down the road what's it look like to you in the future yeah on on the transportation side mm -hmm. last year the department published beyond traffic 2045 and it really looked at you know how people move where people are going how we move things and how we move better and and beyond traffic 2045 looks out 30 years <clears throat> and when you look at transportation you know anything you build you're building bridges how long do they last 30 40 50 something right. years right. so how do you take what's going on today all the activity how we move things how things change how this internet of things, how the smart cities, the connectedness of everything, how will that change what we do in the transportation sector over the next 30 years? And, you know, the Beyond Traffic 2045, it's really, a, it's a draft framework and it opens the door to that conversation to say, okay, we've got all of this. How do we take that data and do that analysis so that we as a country, as we're moving forward, how do we look out over the next 30 years so we're doing the right things mm -hmm. as people are moving and as we're moving things and, and moving forward? Yeah. Logistics requires movement, and yeah. movement yes. is key. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, how we do I'm, that to align the dollars and the savings. I'm impressed and uh, listening to Marie today just, just how big a role Department of Transportation yeah. plays in a lot of these programs. I mean, I don't think people think about the kinds of things that you're, you're talking about yeah. here. I was out on the West Coast about six months ago talking to the developer community, mm -hmm. and they really don't think about transportation as a system of systems, yeah. and they're not thinking outward, you know, 30 years out. They're talking about the two cars that can talk to each other, not right. the entire intersection and how you connect that to a city, how a city, you can't have standalone cities doing their own thing. We need to do the same thing. I mentioned the, right. the red octagon stop Absolutely. sign. We have to be consistent, not just as a nation, but across North America, yeah. too, as this goes to the architecture and some of this other. But again, looking out is beyond traffic 2045 is looking at that for 30 years because of the underlying infrastructure that we're building, the bridges, the roads, sure. all those pieces. And we're moving very fast in the Internet of Things, yet we're looking out 30 years because we've got this infrastructure and you have to look at how metropolitan which areas to, are growing. Sure, which goes back to the points we said. We've got to get it yep. right. We've got to think it through, have a strategy as opposed to just put it out there. Uh, Rick Walsh, where's this all going down the road, buddy? I think what we're going to see in the future is that we're going to base our, our IT, our business structure in the Army on people and data. It's the only two things that are really important. The rest is um, just... I mean, I can buy a piece of hardware from anybody. I can buy security from anybody. But if I don't protect the people and I don't protect the data, people lose value. They lose trust in the system. So it's really about the future is adapt anything you want. Adapt everything. Go for it and make it all work. But make sure you protect the people that are using it and make sure you protect the data they, they need to do going forward. So um, it, it's going to be different. And the Army's looking at basically creating that smart soldier. But the... I, I still go back to I still go back to the situation where we talk about privacy. If I'm going to put, and we talked about it here a lot today, if I'm going to put allow people to have sensors on, people are going to adapt the fact the sensors because it's going to help you keep me well. Okay, um, is my employer going to use that data when a rift comes and say, you know what, I know there's you know. Rick's a little bit overweight, or Rick's got a little cholesterol issue. Uh, Joey doesn't, but I know this because now I've got data. Mm -hmm. You know, should I give up that data? Should I be willing to do that? Do I trust my employer when it gets down to, you know, how are we going to do these kinds of things in the future? And that's that's a that's a big trick. That's that privacy issue that's again. That that's 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 that
Very good points. Well, this was great, man. I mean, some great stuff here today. Let me try to do a little bit of a recap. Uh, <clears throat> when we talked about progress, we talked about wearables and uh, all of the wearable devices that uh, are, are coming along. The Smart Cities program was uh, <clears throat> something exciting to hear about in terms of progress being made. Uh, and this talking about cyber physical things, and then and then Cisco has the Internet of Everything. So we've uh, we've got some new terminology here to to that that open and broadens the understanding of all this. And we talked about progress in the future uh, leading to trem <clears throat> tremendous savings. When we talked about specific programs, Maria did uh, go into some detail on everything that is going on with smart cities. <clears throat> we talked about in industrial controls. Um, Dave, uh, David brought up FirstNet and how FirstNet will play into a lot of these uh, things we're talking about. <clears throat> Lessons learned, I heard collaborate and think big uh, are words I wrote down. And, um, and I think you could say collaborate. That came up over and over and over again, just in different ways about having to work together <clears throat> and getting everybody on board. Um, I also heard from Rick that you need to justify the things you get. This isn't just about getting neat things and uh, you know playing with new neat toys. This is also about justifying and, and actually having uh, the proper use. And that goes back to David's test beds and domains and having the, the, the ability to, to do uh, some of those kinds of things. Uh, the challenges, we said standards got to be there. We, this all has to work together. It's, uh, um, we can't have um, proprietary systems all over the place. We we talked about privacy. We talked about time approaching zero in terms of decision making and the, just the incredible volumes of data and the kinds of decisions that are going to need to be made with that. We talked about education of the people and the exponential growth that we're seeing happening uh, across the, uh, the landscape today. Future, we talked about uh, the need for understanding. We talked about, you know, better life kinds of products that are going to extend life and actually uh, Rick focused on the people. Um, let's face it, let's, uh, it that's, that's what it's all about is focusing on uh, the people. Um, the term trustworthiness came up again and again and again and it came up when we talked about the future and how important that issue will be. And, um, and of course, that uh, uh, what it's going to mean to life in the future in savings and improved ways of, of doing things. Uh, with that, I need to thank our panelists for taking time from their busy days. I know they all have very high-level positions in the, to get out and do the show and share your ideas. Thanks to our sponsors, without which we have no show. Thanks to the great people here at Federal News Radio that uh, treat us so well. And of course, thanks to our listening audience who tune in to the show each month. Uh, you've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.